Um, but I'm very excited to announce that the LAM Research Foundation is sponsoring the LAM Research Leadership Skills Program for the UC Davis Graduate School of Management this year. Um, they are doing this because of their strong commitment to leadership development, not only in their own organization, but also out in the world. Um, LAM Research is a major supplier of wafer fabrication equipment and services to the world semiconductor industry. And they have their headquarters in Fremont, California, but they maintain a, ne a worldwide network of facilities throughout the United States, Asia, and Europe. In addition, to be known, in, in addition to being renowned for its customer service, LAM Research has also been voted one of the best places to work in the Bay Area. Okay. In a minute, I'll introduce Steve Newberry, who is actually the inspiration for the Leadership Skills Program at, here at UC Davis. Um, but first, I'd like to <coughs> recognize another special guest from LAM, Mr. Steve Lindsay. <laughs> Steve is the Vice President of Global Corporate Operations and Corporate Marketing, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Um, I'd like to thank Steve and his leadership at the, uh, Steve Lindsay at the uh, LAM Research Foundation. Um, with the program this year, not only are we going to continue it, but we are also going to be strengthening it with an additional leadership skills assessment program that you'll hear more about in the coming weeks. Um, at this time, I'd like to present a small token to Steve Lindsay of our appreciation. Um, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> It's UC Davis' own olive oil and vinegar, sort of the, the fruits of the UC Davis labor. Okay. Um, I first met Steve Newberry at a d uh, dinner that Chancellor uh, Larry Vanderhoff was hosting for Bay Area business leaders. Um, Steve and I happened to be the first to arrive, so I had a chance to talk with him. And I was particularly inspired by his vision of leadership, uh, the way he talked about leadership, his own experiences, and actually the passion he shared for bringing that leadership um, not only to the corporate world, but also infusing it into, into MBA programs really inspired me. And I have to say it was the seed that was planted with me for really going back to how we offered our experiences to the UC Davis MBA program students, and that, has actually, that seed has blossomed into the leadership skills program that we're offering today. Um, Steve, has <coughs> Steve has done us the honor of speaking to students in the past, and I've been very for fortunate to hear him speak each of those times. Um, the topic that he talks about is values-based leadership, and I think it's particularly appropriate to kick off our program this year. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor. Um, Steve is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and Harvard Business School. He has had over 25 years of management and leadership experience in the high-tech industry. For the past 11 years, he has helped build LAM Research Corporation into a major provider of wafer fabrication <coughs> equipment and services to the world semiconductor industry. Steve joined LAM in 1997 as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. And he was appointed President and Chief Operating Officer in July 1998 and President and Chief Executive Officer in June 2005. As I mentioned earlier, LAM Research Corporation is headquartered in Fremont, California and has a network of facilities throughout the United States, Asia, and Europe. They meet the complex and changing needs of its global customer base through a very, uh, <coughs> excuse me, through a very structured customer service program. In addition to his role as President and CEO, Steve serves as Board Director of LAM and SEMI, which is the Semiconductor Equipment and Materials International Global Trade Organization. Before joining LAM, Steve spent 17 years at Applied Materials Incorporated, where he held senior positions in manufacturing, product development, sales and marketing, and customer service. He also served five years in, in naval aviation prior to coming to uh, Applied Materials. Besides successfully leading a global corporation, Steve also graciously gives back to the UC Davis Graduate School of Management in many ways for which we are extremely grateful. He and his wife Shelley are generous donors to the school, supporting both students and faculty. As I mentioned before, he has been one of our most popular distinguished speakers at the UC Davis Graduate School of Management and has spoken on numerous occasions. He is an invaluable advisor to the Graduate School of Management, particularly in the area of leadership development. For, wi <clears throat> for which I think you will agree, once you've heard him speak today, he is extremely passionate about. Please join me in, in welcoming Steve Newberry. Well, good morning. Thank you, James. Um, with that introduction, uh, now that your expectations have been raised, uh, hopefully <laughs> I won't be too far below them. Um, and you actually had a, a good opportunity to witness that uh, 
as a CEO of a technology company, I actually know how to operate some of the technology, and <laughs> people over 50 actually can troubleshoot stuff and, and figure it out without crying for help from all of you who have grown up with this stuff. And um, there's a lot more to come in the future, that's for sure. So I understand that you're all in your 12-day orientation phase, and you're all about to uh, embark on an exciting journey of a couple years of Graduate School of Management Learning. And um, as James said, I'm, I am really uh, pleased with uh, the opportunity for LAM Research and, and for myself to work with the Graduate School of Management because I think under the, the vision of um, Dean Biggert, uh, you're trying to do some things here in the area of leadership curriculum that goes beyond kind of the traditional uh, thinking in management schools around let's teach people about finance, let's teach them about marketing, let's teach them about management skills, and we'll expose them to the general principles and concept of leadership. But the reality is that leadership is, is, very, is a very complicated environment. Elements of leadership can absolutely be taught. And the best leaders are a combination of their personality, their behaviors, their value system, and what they've been taught in terms of honing it to a, to a finer degree. And the reality of why leadership is important is that as you go forth, and I think almost all of you have, what, four to six years of experience having graduated from your undergraduate uh, programs. And, you know, clearly corporations or a business or whatever it is that you're choosing to do with your life is more and more today having to deal with change and adapting to change. And the f one fundamental basic definition of leadership is, is a set of activities focused on trying to create positive change. And you notice I said positive change because there's a lot of examples in the world of very effective leaders who at least to maybe some people's definition aren't exactly trying to make positive change. They're, they're motivating people to do things that um, perhaps are not in the best interest of the human race. Um, but in the process of trying to create positive change, there's some real fundamental things that I think people who want to be in positions of responsibility, who want to be in positions where they are leading other people, need to understand. And one of them is the importance of a values-based leadership orientation. And so that's what I want to spend a few minutes with you this morning. We'll make it an interactive session. I will stop and ask questions, and you'll get your first opportunity to uh, probably get some feel for what your professors will do here in terms of if you haven't prepared, for sure you'll be the one that has to answer the question. <laughs> and so the way I'll work it is I'll leave it up to somebody to choose to voluntarily answer it, but if I don't get an answer voluntarily, guess what? I get to pick one of you to represent the rest of the students in the room. So. Um, be ready. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to talk about creating a values-based company. And, and given that so many of you have been out in and working for, whether it's small companies or larger corporations, hopefully you'll have a perspective by which you can um, deal with this on. What did we do at LAM Research over the last 11 years? And what do I see as what the real benefits are behind building a strong values-based company? And then some parting words of, of perspective. So, when you're creating a values-based company, it's legitimate to say, why values-based? And, you know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of cynicism around the whole concept of, uh, you know, all that integrity stuff and all of that stuff about the responsibility of management and, and to employees and to the community and to the, to the relationship with what damage you're doing or not. It's all about making money and... Just, just go for it, and all's fair in love and war in, in business. And those guys who practice that philosophy are now in jail. And so, you know, suddenly the whole idea around, you know, maybe things that are based on a foundation of values and the resultant orientation in terms of behavior, maybe those things really are important, and maybe we've lost our way over time in the capitalistic world in pursuit of the almighty uh, extra dollar. And so 
my opinion is that strong and ethical values are in fact critical to the success of the company. I believe that the vast majority of people want to be a part of something that does it the right way. And many of us are capable that if the environment we're in is a jungle and it's survival of the fittest, we'll learn how to develop, develop jungle survival skills. And just because we can do it doesn't mean that we necessarily like it. But if that's the way of the world and you've got to put food on the table, then, you know, it's figure out how to survive or die. And given a choice to work in an environment, in a culture that's dramatically different from those corporations who have that orientation, people readily choose to want to be a part of that and then to behave in ways that are consistent with that. So where do values come from? And, you know, whole courses, whole semesters are spent on where values emanate from. And this is very, very simplistic, but clearly the social and political considerations that exist in your society make up a big element of what your value system is. The weight of history going back thousands of years, and you can kind of see those weight of history cultural things that when the Soviet Union was, in essence, occupying all kinds of countries in the post-World War II, and suddenly the Soviet Union falls, goes back to being Russia, and suddenly all of these countries that many people didn't even know existed uh, suddenly reemerge. And what reemerges with them? The cultural weight of all the past sins and animosity that they've harbored against each other going back literally thousands of years to when things were tribal in nature and everything was territorial in nature. And the human species was far more like the dominant mammals on the planet in terms of prey or predator. And the only question was, were you on a tribe that was more successful at being a predator or were you in a tribe that was a victim and prey? And in many respects, when we look at today's world and we think we're far more advanced and civilized and so much more intelligent and we've put all that warlike behavior behind us, obviously, you don't have to look very far to see that that's absolutely not true. It may be true to a greater extent today, but it still exists to a very significant degree. And how fast we as a species will progress beyond that orientation, who knows? But they definitely have an impact on values. And then your beliefs and norms. And, and the issue becomes, you know, what's the basis for your beliefs and norms? So how many people in this room are Christians? Okay. How many are of the Jewish denomination? Number of you. Now, how many of you that are Christians come from parents that were Jewish? And how many of you are Jewish come from parents that were Christians? So could the fact that you're Jewish have something to do with where you came from and how you're brought up and how you were oriented and exposed to things? Of course it does. And it doesn't mean it's wrong, but it also doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And so one of the things that happens when you go to school, right, is you're going to get taught to think on your own. And ultimately, when you go out into the business world and you're faced with the weight of, Here's how we do things. And you look at it and go, hmm, that's really interesting. Um, but help me understand why you like to do things that don't work. And <laughs> I'd kind of like to contribute to helping you and us figure out how to do it better. And then have people give you all the reasons why we do what we do, and none of which makes sense except it's what we've been doing, and we're comfortable with it. So leadership doesn't start when you become a CEO. Leadership starts from the day you fake on, take on your first responsibility and recognize the opportunity and the need to change something in a positive way. And leadership skills will be needed to convince people that the change is needed, the change is appropriate. You can redefine an objective. You're going to have to align people with you to go after it, and then you're going to have to motivate people. They may hopefully bring their own level of motivation to it. But the leadership process starts 
at the bottom, it affects and spreads and has a role for everybody to play. And it's not just something that's practiced by the senior executives. So from your value set comes a set of behaviors. Okay? So we're not talking about personality. We're not talking about style. We're talking about behaviors. So how many of you have lived in or come from a country other than the United States? Okay? A lot of you. Okay? So to what extent is your value system and your behaviors different than what people who were born and raised in the United States and have grown up in the United States in terms of how they look at what is normal behavior? Is it the same as yours? No, it's very different. And so when you look at their behavior, which is different than what you grew up with, do you view it as different, or do you view it as wrong? Don't lie. How do you view it? <laughs> Your initial reaction is, what the heck is that all about? <laughs> that is absolutely wrong. Now, when you come to another country, you might not view it that way. You might suspend judgment, and you might invest in understanding. Why do the people who were born and raised here behave that way? Why do they value these things? So I had an opportunity to, to learn that. I don't say the hard way, but it was a hard way. I went and lived in Japan for two years. Okay. Anybody here from Japan? Okay. So Japanese culture, U.S. West Coast culture, because U.S. culture is different. New England's different than the South. It's different than the Midwest. It's different than the West Coast. People don't think there's any culture in America but other than <laughs> McDonald's and all the rest of that, but there, but there are. So a ton of things in Japan are exactly 180 out. So we use 911 for emergencies. What do they use? 119. Is that by accident or on purpose? We drive on the right-hand side of the road. They drive on the left-hand side of the road. English is a very direct language. Japanese is a very indirect language. Americans are results-oriented. Japanese are effort-oriented. Not that they don't ultimately need to get results, but they value effort. We go, screw the effort, win or lose. Okay? <laughs> They're much more team and consensus-oriented. We're much more willing to be individualistic, although I think teamwork in America is greatly under-recognized. And in fact, as you will learn, you will have to work in teams here. You will have to develop social skills, relationship skills. And I don't care how smart you are as an individual, nobody cares. How well do you work with others? When you get into a company, I don't care if you're Phi Beta Kappa, 4.0, 4.5, whatever you are, I don't care. If you can't take your education and apply it, and apply it in a manner that causes others to want to work with you, you're worthless. So when you get in the classroom, one of the things you want to think about and really demand of your professors is, hey, let's make sure we get opportunities to expose and to learn how to work with other people. Because when you get out in the business world, that will be an incredibly important skill, incredibly important. So the great story in Japan about being difficult is it, you can know that most of what you're going to experience is the opposite. But that doesn't mean that you can really figure out what to do. So I'll give you a quick little story and you can tell me the answer. So you're driving down the street in a car. Dog runs out in front of you. You're in Japan. You hit the dog. Dog doesn't make it. So the owner of the dog comes out of their house and what conversation ensues? What do you say to the owner? What does the owner say to you? Yeah. That's right. See, in America, what would happen? You would apologize to the owner for running over the dog. In Japan, the owner will apologize to you for 
the dog creating enormous mental anguish and pain because they, they assume and figure that's what you're going through, and they're really sorry and apologetic for it. Okay? And so if you went and then apologized to them, you confused the heck out of them. Okay? And so that's a function of their value system. Okay? And so their behaviors are consistent with the value system that has been present in a very homogeneous society, by the way, that's evolved over thousands of years. So the best advice I can give you about values is to recognize that the behaviors are the manifestation of a value system and that before you pass judgment as to whether those behaviors are right or wrong, try to understand the orientation of where they come from and why they are what they are. Not just what they are, but why do the Japanese behave the way that they do? Why do people in the West Coast of the United States tend to behave the way that they do? And investing and in understanding the origin of people's value system is very worthwhile because as this group is truly international and many people come from many different cultures, when I ask the question in a group of 70 land managers, and every year I, I basically have a, an all-day management forum with groups of 70 managers all around the world. In the United States, the makeup of that team will be at least 50 to 60 percent people who were not born in the United States and English is not their primary language. So, in Fremont, California, they work in a culturally integrated activity. So where is it not? Well, 95 or 98 percent of our Japanese organization is Japanese. Same thing with our Korean group. Same thing with our Taiwanese group. Singapore is kind of a melting pot international location for Asia. But the most integrated workforce is in our California-based workforce. And uh, so learning to deal with different cultures, different values, different behaviors, very important. And as a function of that, the collective expression of behaviors will determine what the culture is, what the environment is of your, of your workforce. So, who's responsible for putting together, well, what is our company value system going to be? And that's the CEO and the top management team. Got to go off together and say, hey, what do we want to stand for? What do we want to believe in? And so, one of the fundamental principles is that the management team has to believe in they, in fact, themselves have to practice those values and demonstrate those behaviors. And they have to reward people whose behaviors are consistent with the value system. I once worked in a company and worked for a president of a company who, whose comment to me was, and he clearly did not practice the values that were published and stated in the company. And he said, you Americans, he was not an American, you don't get it. When you're in power, you get to make the rules. And you're not somebody who has to follow the rules. That's for everybody else. Well, see, that violates one of the fundamental principles of leadership. No, you don't get to do that. You get to make the rules. But if you don't follow them, if you don't practice them, if you don't walk the talk, then people will lose respect for you. Or you might be able to make them conform to the rules but you can't make them respect you. And they might respect your positional power, but they won't respect you as a person if you take that approach that he who makes the rules can break the rules. And Congress wonders why many of us don't respect what they do. When you look at all the rules that they pass, if you look at all the exemptions that Congress has passed for themselves in terms of what we as corporations and you as people have to do, but they don't, they're a classic example of we make the rules and we can exempt ourselves. It doesn't work that way, folks. So, values-based leaders define those behaviors and look at the linkage, okay, between how those values-based actions affect all the constituency. So customers, employees, suppliers, investors, and the community upon which you, which you work in. And so, those values are going to define standards of behavior. And behavior that we use with each other behavior that we use with customers, but more importantly, it actually will help us know what the right decision is that we have to make 
in terms of doing the right thing, being honest, being accountable, and behaving in a way that enables the customer to trust us in terms of what we're doing, as opposed to not being upfront with the customer, not being genuine, not being honest with the customer. So from that standards of behavior, those executives have to personally commit. They have to get integrated into the management philosophy. They have to be oriented to a long-term focus in the best interest of people over time. Because one of, the, one of the challenges that company faces, investors have a tendency to be one of being very short-term focused. And that's not true of all, but some investors. Some employees might be short-term focused because they don't intend to be there five years later. But the reality is a management team has to think in terms of what is in the long-term best collective interest of growing and generating a set of profits and providing for the long-term success of the enterprise. And if you do this right in terms of selecting a good set of values, and there's no one right set of values, there's just which ones do you want, why do you want them, they're not the only values, they're the ones that you want to make sure are the consistent values, and organizations can add to them, they cannot subtract to them. And if you do that right, then over time, you will see success manifested in a wide variety of ways in terms of what ultimately the biggest benefit of a values-based set of behaviors is it tends to build trust. If your customers trust you, if the employees trust the management team, if the employees trust each other and the management team trusts each other, you would be amazed what can be accomplished. All it takes is one of those constituencies to lack trust and you're in big trouble. If the employees don't trust each other, they don't work effectively together. If they don't trust management, you're in big trouble. And if the customers don't trust you, forget it. You're going to go out of business. And so one of the other fundamental things that you want to think about relative to leadership is, what are the things that I do that can grow people's trust in me, in my group, in my organization, in my company? What are the things that I do that may be causing people to question whether they should trust? And are there things that I'm doing that actually are degrading trust? With trust, it's almost unlimited what you can accomplish. And without it, there's almost nothing you can accomplish. So core values at LAM Research. So these eight core values is what we as a management team 11 years ago went off and worked through for three or four days. And when we, when we finally got them, then the issue was, okay, guys, there was about 10 of us. We start with this is what we believe in and we practice and we hold ourselves accountable to. People start squirming in their chairs a little bit. What do you mean by we have to practice this and we're going to be held accountable. This is what I said. We're going to practice it and we're going to be accountable. What does accountable mean? If you fail to practice these core values, then depending upon the seriousness of what you did that was inconsistent with it or the frequency at which you do it, you won't be a senior executive in this company. So that caused a few people to reconsider whether they really wanted some of these values. And if you look at those value sets up there, which, which value do you think they might have had the greatest concern in terms of being able to practice it in the eyes of their
you can have people that, that have that concern. That, but that, that wasn't an issue with this group of guys. But it could very well be at, at other places. Yes? Sure, one of the reasons I'm smarter can make better decisions to you because I have more information than you. So if I make sure you never have as much information as I do, guess what? I'm always a better decision maker. People never do that, do they? <laughs> they, they wouldn't possibly think about controlling the flow of information so therefore they can always ensure that they're better able to be better. So that, that's an issue. What's another one? Ownership and accountability. You like to own some trips but not ownership? No, they like to own the title and the money but not the responsibility and the consequences for failing to perform. But these guys weren't worried about that. But definitely, if you get into the ranks, this whole issue of ownership and accountability, it's like, hey, I want, I want the title. I want the, I want the decision-making authority. And if I screw it up, I don't want you to do anything about it. Okay? Well, it, I'm sorry. It don't work that way. If you want to be in management and you want the title and you want the money and you want the authority to make decisions, it's not that you can't make mistakes, but you've got to make a lot more good decisions than you made bad decisions, or why should management trust you with that responsibility? And more importantly, what do you think your people think of you? It's like, gee, why do I have to work for this incompetent person? I mean, it creates all kinds of issues for them. So, you know, you're in the graduate school of management, and a lot of you are looking that you want to be a member of management. Well, you better understand, absolutely and clearly, it isn't about prestige and, hey, I can come back to my GSM reunion 10 years from now and look at what title I have. Okay? And there's people who absolutely get focused on that stuff. You go back to, I mean, spent time at Harvard. I mean, it's like unbelievable stuff over there. Those guys compete on stupid stuff. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, you got to want to be in a position of responsibility because you need to be motivated by a desire to want to contribute in ways that you're capable of and, and work with people in ways that get them to perform better than on their own they could do and better than they believe they're individually or collectively capable of. And you've got to really enjoy and love the process of achieving things through other people. And as you move up, it's less and less about you. It's more and more about them and what you can do to help them be successful. So in the end, though, you have to be accountable for what you have ownership for. So that ain't it either, although there are people that will be concerned. Yes? Clearly, without honesty and integrity, you will never be trusted. But they were okay with that, too, because they understood that. I mean, some of the shifty people around there have a different definition of, well, how honest do I have to be? Kind of like, uh, honesty is actually one of those black and white things. Oh, in American culture it is. Is it in Asian cultures? When does saving face which is really big in a lot of the Asian cultures, justify them not being as truthful about what's going on. What's that? It's quite gray. And see, in society, things can be gray. In the business, if you allow it to be gray, what you've just allowed in is confusion. And... One of the things that you have to do in a global company is to find what the company's value system is. And it may be different than what the cultural norms are. And you have to train and educate people. Outside these walls, you can do X, Y, Z. Inside these walls, when we talk about honesty, which means what's going on is what's going on. And if you're asked to give a status of what's going on, you give what the status is. And if that ends up embarrassing somebody, who wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing very well, well, so be it. 
because they signed up for that responsibility and that's what comes with it. Now, you don't have to burn people, you don't have to intentionally embarrass people, but in a company, if you don't know what the facts are about what's not working, what's your chances of being able to fix it? Zero. If you know that what you're doing doesn't work and it's out there on the table, then you can fix it and people can bring help, et cetera, et cetera. But it is, it is a challenge for some people, but that's still not the one that they were most concerned about. Well, by the time we're done here, we'll have all eight of them on the, <laughs> which also speaks to the fact that how people look at a set of values is very much individually oriented in terms of what they think the most important value is, et cetera. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to, you have to reconcile through that with people. Yes? Okay, why? What's the definition of mutual trust and respect? When do I violate? Is the definition of respect a simple one? Is it situational? Is it in the eyes of the recipient of whatever occurred in terms of whether they feel like what you did was disrespectful? Absolutely. It's highly subjective. Now, you can frame it. You do these kinds of things, that absolutely is a violation of behavior that's trustworthy and respectful. And then you're in the gray zone. You do these kind of things. It depends on the context. depends on the recipient. depends on a whole bunch of things. And then... You know, if you're over here, you may be very respectful and very trustworthy. You also may be totally ineffective. It's like somebody gets up and explains to you why they're one month behind schedule on a three-month project, and it would be very respectful to say, well, you know, thank you, Bob. I really appreciate that effort. I know you're really trying, and I just want you to know we're behind you. Just, just keep going and, you know, keep trying, and, you know, we really appreciate the hard work. Or uh, Bob being one month behind on a three-month project, and not knowing, as you were going along, what the problems were, what the issues were, not putting in place a good accountability system to track where you were, is unacceptable. You got two weeks to fix it. You got two weeks to get a corrective action plan in place. I'll see you in my office at 3 o'clock on Friday, two weeks from now. Now, Bob may be tough and go, I deserve that. I'm doing a lousy job. I better get my act together. No problem. Somebody else who may have been in the, the, the team meeting, may have said, oh, wow, he really nailed Bob to the wall and shouldn't have done it in a public setting. If he did it in private, it'd be okay, but he did it in public, made Bob look bad in public, so that was disrespectful. So, is it or isn't it? It's a really gray area, and it also depends on the culture of your company, and it depends on how much time you have, if I had to do private corrective action discussions with all the executives that I was running business reviews with, I'd, I'd never have time to sleep. So you've got to do stuff in a fast-paced, fast-moving company that occurs in public forums, and it isn't always comfortable. Now, crossing the line would be, Bob, let me tell you something. You are the stupidest blah, blah, blah I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe that you're this dumb. And you know what? Actually, you're so stupid, I'm taking away your authority to run this project. But thank you very much for trying. Okay? And that would be clearly crossing the line in terms of you now attacked the individual, right? So they feared this definition being so individually subjective that people would call them and say, you violated mutual trust and respect. And so... We had to get over, and, and part of the idea was to say, you know what, let's eliminate it then. Too much subjectivity. And then we said, well, wait a minute. You're right, it's hard to define, but is it a value that we should be aspiring to? Is it a value that we have to work through the gray zone and that it's fundamentally not something that is always going to be agreed upon, but is it a right value to have? And we ultimately agreed on that. Then ultimately, when you go into a company and you introduce a set of values that in, in reality, the behaviors are not consistent with. Now, the first thing people look at is, well, if I hunker down and wait long enough, this will go away. 
this is just another management initiative, and you know, they're not really serious. And what's the first thing they look at in terms of whether they start the process of trusting that you're serious? Yeah, whether the leaders demonstrated. And when they don't, what does the president or CEO do about it? So after I fired two of that original group for core values violations, then they agreed we were serious about it. And five years later, after all kinds of investment in time and energy and effort, they now own the value system. It's theirs. And they hold each other accountable. The whole employee base holds the management team accountable. The management team holds everybody accountable. It's a total interweave of holding people accountable. But in the beginning, you've got to recognize, if you're introducing this, you're trying to create what you believe is positive change. So you've got to explain the reason, explain the vision, explain the value, align people, and reward them, and then punish those who choose not to. And those in the most senior positions actually get punished the most. Because by definition, they're supposed to set the right example. And when you're dealing with three, four, five thousand people, it takes a while to get the entire global organization bought in and believing and actually behaving consistently. Imagine what it was like for Lou Gerstner when he went into IBM 15 or 20 years ago and was brought in to go change the culture of IBM. They only had a couple hundred thousand employees. And one thing that Gerstner says is that if he was going to have spent more time on any one thing, do you think it was on their market strategy, their product strategy, their segmentation strategy, their technology strategy, or on the organization design and development and orientation to culture in the company? And he would have spent more time on the latter. Because ultimately, IBM's success was going to be whether they could change some significant flaws in the behavior sets and the values sets in the company, and ultimately changing the culture. So I'm going to move quickly through this. What we said is some of the foundation things about how we do things are got to do with honesty and integrity, got to do with trust and respect, got to do with open communications, ownership and accountability and teamwork. Those things are all foundation givens. But we have to have an achievement orientation, which means we're not motivated by fear of failure. And we're not motivated by performing to a level that gets us just enough beyond failure so that we can exist or we can keep our job. We're motivated to achieve to a definition of we set the standard of excellence in the industry, which means we want to be the best. And the minute you go to a group and say, who has not been the best, by the way, we are going to commit ourselves to be the best. And they're looking around the room going, who are you talking about? We've just demonstrated that we're not capable of being the best. And the company we took over had gone from like 34% market share to 22 and a half. It was like a 747 and a nosedive from 40,000 feet, and we climbed on board at 10,000 and said, let's pull this baby out before it crashes. So we also said we're going to be oriented toward innovation and continuous improvement, and we've got to put the customer and the company first, then your organization, then the individual. So from that, we had these vision objectives. We want to be number one, not in customer satisfaction, but in trust because trust is an all more encompassing, even greater encompassing word than satisfaction. Number one in market share in the markets we serve. We want to build a culture and environment where successful people want to be here. They want to stay here if they're here, or we want to attract and recruit people who want to be a part of success, who, if we can find them, have been successful all their lives. Because if people have been successful all their life, they have with them an achievement orientation. It's part of who they are. It's part of their character. We wanted to be a multi-product company and our financial performance, and we would talk to customers about this, look, we don't exist solely to provide for your profitability. We have obligations to our shareholders, 
and we have obligations to you, we got to make a profit so we can reinvest it, so we can develop the products that you need to stay on the leading edge of extremely high technology world. So then we came up with this mission statement. There's a couple of important things in the statement. One starts with dedicated to the success of our customers. So putting the customer first, so it's consistent with the value of think customer, company, individual. Consistent with the idea of being world class is that's what achievement oriented people are motivated to be, the best. And so, you know, what I'll tell people is, have you thought about what's different about the makeup of the people in a company that's world class versus the makeup of the people in a company that's not? What's different? What do you think is different? Do you want to go to world, work for a world class company? Typically, there will be an intensity there, but there's a lot of companies with intensity who are not world class. Necessary, but not sufficient. But, it, but I mean, you're exactly right. That has to be there, but it's not sufficient. Um, I mean, I think that as the world continues to flatten and companies have talented people from all kinds of different cultures and places, that will be a critical skill set for that company to be successful. But is Toyota a world-class company? Uh, in Toyota headquarters in Japan, how many non-Japanese do you think are running around in there? Not, not hardly any. Now, interestingly, Nissan, which struggled mightily. You know who's running Nissan? Frenchman. Like, that's like crazy. <laughs> so, and so, you know, it, that's, that's not it either. Let's, let's kind of think more philosophical, okay? Okay, that gets, that's getting closer. Maybe simple to say, but I think it's it, uh, simply people expect to succeed. And if they don't succeed, they expect to succeed next time. Yeah, I mean, here, here's a difference. And think about this in terms of world-class athletes. And we just went through the Olympics, right? And there's clearly a bunch of them that have no chance, and they know it. So they're competing for, you know, being a part of the competition in the Olympics. But then there's a bunch of them who are, in fact, have the potential to to win or to medal. And they're going to go through years of grueling training. And then they're going to put themselves up on the public stage. And are they motivated by a fear of failure or are they driven by a need to achieve? Clearly, they're driven by a need to achieve because if they are afraid of failure, you don't go into competition because you always will lose at some point in time. You're never always going to win. So you can't be afraid of failure if you want to know what it feels like to win. Now, what else do they have? As you said, an expectation of winning. You're right. They have a belief that they can and they will. And world-class companies have a bunch of people who expect and absolutely believe that they can be the best. Now, do they believe that in the company context as an individual? Or do they believe it in the context of collectively as a whole, we can set standards of excellence and be the best? And it's, it's the we. Because anybody here world class in anything? I mean, the best in the world? I mean, we might have a 
could have an Olympic diver in here. Of course, it wouldn't be an American, it'd be a Chinese, but. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, anybody here the best in the world? Yeah? Uh, I might answer that more about the Olympics. I'd like to hear from somebody else who's been there and seen it and has been able to see the things that they've seen and done. Was that because of you by yourself or a team? Uh, yes, I didn't start off as a team. I'm the leader. Okay. So you were part of a world-class activity, but you're not a world-class individual. You might think you are. I just told you that you're not, but that's okay. <laughs> so who's world-class in something? Anybody the best athlete in the world in anything here? Anybody get the highest SAT score? I mean, 1,600's it, right? Or now it's 2,400, right? Lots of people do that, so... Right. And, and people can tell you that you're not, like they told J.T. O'Sullivan after eight teams kicked him off, and now he's starting quarterback. And world class isn't in a business context about what you are as an individual. What it is is about your belief system, what it is about your expectations, what it is about your effort, what it is about your ability to translate all of that, though, and get results, because, again, you know, trying hard isn't enough. Okay? But it's being committed to the concept of the philosophy and the belief system that we, collectively together, using our combined brain power, our motivations, our energies, our analysis of things, we can actually figure out how to do this better than anybody else in our industry, maybe in, in the world. And it absolutely gets done, obviously, because there are world-class... Somebody has to be the best. Okay, so when we started at LAM and we said, let's be world-class, a bunch of people came up and said, why do we have to do that? <laughs> I mean, literally. And, 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 like, we're happy here, like, being number three and, you know, kind of being a part of this industry. And I said, so what are you afraid of? So what, what are people afraid of when they come right out and say, I, I don't want to be world-class? What are they afraid of? Failure. They're afraid of failure. What else are they afraid of? They, yeah, they, that's, you know, they might not be able to be a best, so they're afraid to fail, yeah. They're afraid of change, true, yeah. Yeah, the effort it takes. To be world class, I'm going to have to work too hard. And you know what, I kind of like coasting along here. So I just simply said, well, you might be comfortable going out to the customer as the third place company and saying, you know what, let me give you all the reasons why you should buy from the third best product. Let me give you all the reasons why you should put your company at risk and buy this product that clearly the market has said is, is third place. I said, I want to go out and sell and talk to customers about what we have that's the best, and if it isn't the best today, how we're going to make it the best, and how we're going to commit publicly to our customers, to our employees, to our shareholders. We are going to be satisfied with nothing but figuring out how to be the best. And we may fail, folks. But here's one thing's for sure. If you don't try, you will fail. But if you try, you'd be surprised how you actually can be extremely successful and more successful than you ever thought you could be. And that's what happened at LAM Research, where Jim Bagley and I and the team that we brought in, we had a, a, a pretty strong definition of what we thought success was. We so greatly exceeded that. Because the way the people bought in and how we got contributions at the lowest level of the company in every organization all around the world, it was unbelievable. But it starts with a core philosophy, and then you build from there. And so then we said innovative productivity solutions, and that's a function of, of being uh, innovative and continuous improvement. So you have all three of those elements in the mission statement. And Every company has a mission statement, and most times nobody ever talks about them. We teach our mission statement. We reinforce our mission statement. We talk to people about why those words are in that mission statement and what we expect of people in terms of aligning their behaviors to what it takes to make the mission statement reality. So then you have to do things like 
as we evaluate people. It's not just what you do, it's how you do it, and you get evaluated on the consistency of your behaviors aligned to the core values. And if it's high, it's great. If it's not, it knocks down your merit pay. So your pay is tied to performance and your value system. And then we have reward systems. So simple things that will go above and beyond that are a function of indicative of your behaviors, your attitude, putting the customer and the company first. Big ones in terms of a Vista award. Uh, we pay, what's it, $5,000 now, Steve, or something, to each team member of a winning Vista. And then Pinnacle, which is a worldwide competition, I think we pay $10,000 per person. Um, and you know, we're really looking for the best examples of core values-driven behaviors that result in the most significant impact for the customer and the company. And then we, we have all kinds of forums where we constantly reinforce and train. We train to our values. We train to what we believe in on a constant basis in the company. And it's participated in from people who are in the training organization to members of the senior management team to the CEO. Our business system has, as the core of it, the core values. And so on the right is the planning process activities that ultimately, on the left, we have to execute. So we have an execution system that's a corporate accountability system. Now we track what we're doing and we compare where we're at and we make ongoing adjustments. Every company has one. Some are effective, some are not. And at the heart of it is whatever we do is we have to assess it in terms of behaviors consistent to the core values. So what are the benefits? Well, customers want to buy from you. So we took our market share from 27 to 49 in the past six years. Our turnover of high potential key people, 1%. Our shareholders typically lamb stock price, outperforms others in the industry, and sometimes by a significant amount. So in closing, what are my views, for whatever they're worth, I think you need to think about to build a successful career? One, find a successful company that's in an exciting growth market. Growth is important because it provides opportunities. And there's lots of exciting growth markets out there. Two, understand the existence or the lack thereof of a values-based culture. Understand that every company has a culture, for better or for worse. When you're interviewing and you think that they're interviewing you, make sure you're interviewing them. And make sure you're trying to find out. What's teamwork like around here? What's open communication like around here? How much is somebody who challenges the status quo embraced or put down? And ask it of enough people and you'll either get a lot of discrepancies or you'll get a lot of continuity. Either way, you'll learn a lot. And one of your jobs is find out as much as you can about what the real environment's like in that company, not all the marketing hype and all the rest of the stuff that the recruiters are telling you. And if you know somebody that works there, then of course you can get a much better perspective of what the reality is. And you want to work for a management team that you can trust, that you can respect, and that you can learn from. So whether it's your first level management or all the way up to the senior management, what is that company's track record of promoting from within? So what are the opportunities for you depending upon your ambitions, your skill set to build a rewarding career. And last, if you bring an achievement orientation, you bring that mindset that you are going to work to be the best that you can be, whatever that is, and it's different for everybody, and you apply it within that environment, good things will happen to you. Not necessarily every year, every month, or every company. But over time, if you bring your set of values, make good choices as to where you are going to apply your value set and merge it with another good environment, and you commit to working hard and doing the best you can, you will be successful. And one last piece of advice that, that people ask me all the time for their children, they go, what career should my child choose to have a successful career? 
So the first question I ask is, well, what's your definition of success? So what do you think they tell me? Money. Money. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Parents assume that money and happiness are synonymous. That's totally baloney. <laughs> what else do parents want? They assume parents, you know, parents are concerned about security and things like that. Yeah. So they want you to be able to secure a job. And they want you to work for a prestigious company. Right. Because if you're a prestigious company, then you're a prestigious person. Because only prestigious people work for prestigious companies. <laughs> that go to prestigious schools. That screen you out when you're 12 years old. And if you don't make the cut, it's over for you. So people can criticize the U.S. education system. And maybe the secondary system's got some issues. The U.S. college system doesn't care if you're 28, 40, whether you flunked out of junior high school. They don't care. What they care is what are you going to do at this point in time for the rest of your life. And the world is your opportunity. And so to be successful, to put that to use, it's not about title, it's not about money. If you're after title and you're after money, you might get lucky and find happiness and success. Most people, though, heard about midlife crisis, right? So they wake up one day, triggered by the mortality, typically, of key people in their family, that you suddenly realize that you're not going to live forever and where am I in my career? Oh my God, what am I doing here? How did I get to where I am? And, and am I doing what I've always wanted to do? Or am I doing what my parents expected of me, people expected of me, and I was good at, but I've never liked it? Today, midlife crisis doesn't get triggered by mortality because people are living so much longer. Because if you waited for that, you'd be 65, your career's over anyway, and your parents die when you're 85 or something, right? <laughs> so it's triggered by other things. It's triggered by... A realization, I only have so much more to live, whether it's your life or your working career, and am I really enjoying what I'm doing? And not every day, but overall. Do I get up in the morning and am I excited and motivated and passionate to come in and work with the people I work with and make a difference? And the only way that happens is you got to go do what you're passionate about, whatever that is. It doesn't matter if it's being an artist, a musician, being a, a business executive, being in high tech, being in real estate, it, it doesn't matter. It's what are you passionate about? Because if you're passionate about something, then you will be the best that you can be in whatever that is. And you will reach whatever level of success your talent allows you to. But you're going to be in an arena, in, a, in an environment that you really enjoy. And if you choose out of any school, any environment, to go for the highest paying job, to go for the highest title, and in the course of that, put yourself in positions where you're working for the wrong company, the wrong industry, or whatever, you're going you're gonna to learn the hard way. And lots of you will do that. But I'll tell you one thing. Typically, the companies that pay the most money and offer the most titles to less experienced people are the people who have to because others won't work for them. So be careful about that. Not always true. And it's a bit of a generalization, but be careful. If you're getting offered a lot more money from another company, you better ask yourself, why are they paying so much more than these other guys? There's almost always a reason. Okay? So I enjoyed the opportunity to spend a few minutes uh, chatting with you, um, open for whatever questions you might have and whatever time frame uh, Anya and, and James will allow to occur here. Um, any, any questions that uh, I can answer? Sure. So, so you want to so, so the question I have, uh, so this values-based leadership and the fact that your company is really based on core values, um, how much does this apply to the customers you do business with? Do you evaluate your customers also to a set of core values or you pretty much sell to anybody who buys? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we, 
measure customer trust in terms of their trust in us. And we have different customers who we look at their integrity in terms of how they deal with us. And there absolutely is a continuum of customers who deal with their suppliers in very um, trustworthy ways and some who they would throw you under a bus if they could make an extra buck out of you. They just, they're just there to use you and abuse you. So in our industry, there's you know, maybe 20 customers that spend 80% of $30 billion. So it's a little difficult to go to a company and say, you know what, you guys are a bunch of lion thieves and we're just not going to sell to you because then you're shrinking your market too much. What we do do, and I've done it on occasion, is a, a, f a few of those customers can be abusive to our employees. And I won't tolerate that. And so a lot, and a lot of times it's Asian customers who think that the suppliers only exist to do whatever they want, and they're verbally abusive, and they're abusive in other ways. Then I'll go in to their top management, and I'll tell them, look, these kind of behaviors, I'm sure you don't support. And I know you don't know about them, but they're occurring, and I got to tell you, they got to stop or I'm going to pull my people out of the fab and we're going to stop supporting your installed base. And so I've never had negative ramifications and I've gotten it shut down in terms, I mean, we used to go to work for Korean companies. They, they could give you your passport. And they didn't go home until they decided to give you your passport back. So we had to step in and stop that activity. Okay. You know, and then they couldn't go home at night until the customer said, you can go home after working 18 hours a day, which after a while, it's very unsafe when you're working on pieces of equipment that if you make the wrong move, it'll kill you. So, you, you know, as a company, you've got to draw the line on that. If the purchasing people want to lie, I mean, it's kind of, you know, what are you going to do, right? You kind of work through it, and, and you have respect for those who behave in ways that really should occur, and you, and you don't, but you still have to do business. Yes. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Closest to the mic, right? Hi, hi, Steve. Thanks for visiting with us. I'm interested in the transition in value system. I think human history has examples of cultural change when a group with new values comes in, but it's often a messy process. You mentioned a, a bit on how you implemented the new set of core values, but do you have any other uh, bits to share with us about whether you had second thoughts or, or troubles in that transition phase? Well, we had, we had lots of issues. I mean, first off, we had to get the management team to agree on, I mean, you could have 30 core values or you could have three. You know, what's the right number that are substantively significant to cover a, a fairly broad range, but, but not, not to try to represent them as they're the only values that are right because there's clearly others. But you've got you to choose. You've got to narrow it. And then the first thing that happens, people go, well, how come you didn't choose this one? And... How come you chose that one? And so you have to go in and you have to teach people, why did we choose these values? So you have to expose yourself to helping people understand, this is what, because a management team's got to pick what they believe in. And ultimately, the philosophy that a company runs starts with who that founding group was originally, and then it may evolve when another group comes in. And not everybody's going to agree with what your philosophy is. And so some of those people will leave, and some people will buy in, and then you're trying to attract people. And, and so the reality is, is that most people are, one, resistant to change by nature because change is scary and upsets the status quo, even if there's recognition that, you know what, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're probably going to like, not be successful. So people say, well, the rest of you guys change. I'll just kind of keep doing what I'm doing, right? So you have to create. John Cotter, Harvard um, leadership professor, said, you know, change management is a, there's a real methodology to it. And just like selling something to a customer, you have to first off determine what is the level of recognition of the need for this product. So in this case, the product is what we're going to stand for and how we're going to do it. And do people believe and recognize we need to change our behaviors? We need to change what's important to us. And if it's low, 
You don't implement anything until you get them to a much higher level of recognition of need. And you're doing things simultaneously, but if you're trying to shove stuff in while the recognition of need is low, just like with the customer, you will not get a sale. And if you don't think that every successful leader and manager is a great salesperson, you're fooling yourself. And I'm not talking about, you know, swarmy, you know, slimy salespeople. I'm talking about, what are you selling? You're selling people on where we're going, why it's important, and how we're going to do it. And if you don't understand what it is, trust me, we think we know. And follow me, and we'll be successful. And there's a bunch of people who go, it's like, why should I follow you? The last guy we followed let us off a cliff. So what makes you different? What makes you better? you got to make a tremendous investment in getting the buy-in. And that's, that's the alignment process. And so in thinking about in leadership, you got to have a vision of where you want to go. Fine. Vision process is not some magic thing. I mean, it can be as simple as a new objective, a new direction, or it can be very complex. The difficult part of any leadership process in, in, in the br bringing a new value system is, is, is an example of that. It's aligning people to it. And you know, there's an old saying, if you want people to understand something, how many times do you have to expose them to it? Ever heard that one? How many times do you have to see something before you really absorb it and really understand it? Like three times? Five times? You guys are really bright, right? Five times ought to be good enough for you, right? I don't know, we should ask the professors in the back, how many times does it take exposing them before they actually really get it? It's like seven to 10. So here's what happens. A management team spends days, weeks, months, you know, absorbing something. And then you come out to the company and go, let's show you this great new idea, thing, whatever. And you explain it to them and say, okay, let's go. And like people are going like, what the heck is this stuff? And you understand it inside out, backwards and forwards because you've been living with it for three months. And what people don't recognize is the investment in time and repetity that you've got to do to get people aligned. And then those that get it after the third, when they're sitting in the sixth or seventh, they're going, my God, would you get on with this thing? I get it. But you've got to get everybody into the process. And it takes incredible amounts of time, which is why it takes three to five to seven years to change the culture of a company. The smaller the company, the faster you can do it. The bigger the company, the harder it is to do it. So there's tons of objections. And who has to lead that process personally, the CEO or the president? I mean, there's just no substitute for that. You know, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that Jack Welch was a great leader, one of the reasons, because there were lots of them, is he understood the role that he had to play as a CEO of GE and personally lead that whole cultural change for GE. And he was up in Crotonville where they had the GE University system tons of time. And he'd go out to the plants. And he personally was the evangelist for the new GE. Where do we have to go? How do we need to do it? He understood. Whereas most CEOs, you know where they are? They're sitting in the boardroom, you know, working on strategy or whatever the heck they do in those boardrooms. And, and those guys don't, don't make it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but part of it. Um, uh, yes. I actually have two questions. One, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, that your CFO came from Tyco. And uh, I was wondering how, if, that, if he had, like, if there was an adjustment or if you were worried about him coming in, <laughs> you know, or if, the, or if he had any particular stories about that which, you know, made his transition different or difficult. And then also, have you ever had any tension within your core values between being world class and also acting with integrity. You know, you guys have a lot of scholarships in the community and everywhere you are, and it seems like you really want to build ties in where you are, but, you know, there's obviously a lot of pressure to move to lower cost production areas. I mean, do you find, have you had to deal with tensions between the core values? Um, so first off, relative to the Tyco thing, Martin left Tyco well before some of the Tyco things that were going on, and, and he was not, he was not that senior of executive within the whole Tyco. He was in a division of Tyco, and most of the problems with Tyco were, uh, you know, there by the grace of God, probably would go a lot of CEOs in, in big companies where the culture of entitlement, even Jack Welch got in trouble with, you know, his parachute out of GE in terms of all the entitlements and the use of the corporate jet and corporate apartments and corporate this and corporate that. 
I mean, if you work at a Silicon Valley firm, one, we don't have corporate jets, and two, we don't have corporate departments, and we don't even have company cars, and I mean, we don't have any of those perk systems. And what happens with perk systems is they get viewed by senior executives as entitlements, and I mean, and so then they start to cross the line, and you know, see, I put my own security system in as opposed to having the company put in the security system to protect me this critical little asset called the CEO. I mean, it just, those things are the way it was, and, and they really abused that in terms of what that CEO did. And, you know, the, the laws punished them, and, and rightfully so, because I believe that if you are in a position of trust, whether you're in a public company, uh, a private company, your obligation would be to your employees, but if you're in a public company and you're taking public money, um, you violate the trust, the consequences of violating trust, and, and the rewards that come with, you, you are, have high levels of trust, you have high responsibility, high accountability, but you're, you're, if you're successful, you're going to get highly compensated. Typical capitalistic reward, consequence, supply and demand, there's not that many people that can do it. But if you violate that trust, consequences are huge, and they should be. Okay? So relative to conflicts between being world class and commitment to community and all the rest of that kind of stuff, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you, you cannot afford to compromise the ability of your company to be successful on behalf of the customers and the employees and make decisions that will compromise that by being committed to a community or an environment if it's no longer competitive. Um, we have a company that we just acquired. They're in Austria. And they have 550 employees. And uh, they've struggled. They probably really should only have about 400 employees. And so we're going through the process with them of what's the responsibility of the management team that if in this division is losing money, that if we keep 550 people, we're going to keep losing money. And if we keep losing money, then you run the risk that you shut the whole thing down. So now, 550 people don't have a job, but we can figure out how to get more cost competitive and more effective at what we do, but we're probably going to have to do that with 400 people. Are you as a management team willing to deal with the tough choices of sacrificing 150 jobs to save 400, and then with the opportunity that if you're successful with growth, five years from now, maybe there's 700 jobs? Right? One of the things that comes with responsibility is the ability to make the tough decisions that nobody wants to have to make. But if you're not willing to make them, or you make the wrong ones, lots of people suffer the consequences. So the process of figuring out what the right answer is, your value systems can actually help you by saying, look, who, who are our responsibilities to? They're to the customers and they're to the company first then organizations, and then people. And ultimately, what's in the best long-term interest of the greatest amount of people in totality and, and, and sorting through all of that and um, sometimes spending a lot of sleepless nights and then making the decision that you have to make um, and then living with it. And, you know, uh, those aren't fun decisions. But if you fail to make them, you can actually be far more harmful to everybody. Hi, uh, my name is Tony. I'm from Shanghai. Uh, I, I want to elaborate a little bit on your, um, your, your, on your cases in Japan because I have an like, opportunity to stay in Japan for well, more than one year. So uh, I want to discuss with you because uh, uh, you, you are right. I mean, when you, you drive a car, you hit a dog, I mean, the owner of the dog come out and uh, will apologize to you. That's correct. But what's next? I mean, the next step is that actually that man is also, uh, also very angry at you. I mean, he also expect you to apologize. I mean, in Japan, you always say to people, bend down to each other, okay, again, again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's like, I mean, yeah. they are just modest. I mean, they are humble. But uh, inner side, we are the same all over the world. I mean, they expect that. If you do not apologize, I mean, you, if you drive a car, you hit a dog, if not apologize to an owner, I mean, that will be a different situation. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, yes. you're right. Uh, but uh, see, their behaviors, though, yeah. Yeah, behavior, just are behavior. a function of the fact that I, they're, as a society, have 
developed a set of ways yeah. in which they relate to each other. Yeah, that's very different. Yeah, it's it's just uh, actually it's very similar to Chinese Chinese culture. Also, you know, in traditional Chinese, we call our son a dog, a dog son. I mean, call your son a dog. It's, a, it's like it's just humble. But actually, he's proud of his son. But he will say that. For example, I have a son. If uh, he he's in uh, kindergarten, if he have a fight with another boy. And we both two parents are coming down there, and uh, the first thing I will I will do is that maybe I blame my son, even beat my son. I mean, it depends on the situation. But the next thing is that I expect the parents of the other boy will do the same thing. I mean, if he do not do the same thing, I will change my attitude. I mean, better, let's, better leave yeah. that behavior set behind you when you, if you're in America as a parent, or you're <laughs> in jail. Yeah, it's <laughs> a different. I mean, it's the same inside. I mean, even when I come home, I will tell my son maybe. Uh, don't you forget the maneuver I tell you about kung fu and uh, yeah, it's a different. I mean, just we want to save face for each other. I mean, yeah. I, I wanna. Uh, no matter, maybe it's the fault of other other uh, other kid. I will blame my son. I mean, whatever the reason. But I also expect the other parents to do the same. Then we can save each other's face. If he do not do the same, I mean, even if it's my son's fault, I may change my attitude. You know, it's a. Yes, uh, I mean you want. I mean you do not just say the behavior of the Asian people. You should put yourself in his own shoe. I mean he want your you. You should know his expectation. Otherwise, you cannot settle the. You have to understand the, the basis yeah. of the behaviors. Yes. But here's the flip. Yeah. How many Asians invest in understanding why the behaviors of Americans exist as opposed to just saying our value system is better and right and yours is wrong? Uh, we cannot say that it's just a tradition. I think. Oh, I lived in Japan. I can yeah. guarantee you that 95% of the Japanese were more than happy to tell you I screwed up whatever the behaviors were in America that were <laughs> different than in Japan. Yeah. So I'll give you an interesting story. Okay. So you go to a grocery store. In America, most grocery stores, when when you're at the checkout stand, does somebody put your groceries in a bag? Typically. And then they offer to carry your bag out to the car. That's good service, right? And in Japan, you go to a gas station, pull up. There's no such thing as self-service. I mean, they come running out, and they pump your gas. They clean your windshield. They check under the hood. And then when you're ready to go, they get out and stop traffic so you can get out. <laughs> now, in America, of course, what do we do? We pump our own gas and take your life pulling out into traffic. So Japanese comes to America and goes, man, you have lousy service in your gas station. So what do I say to him? Well, you have lousy service in your grocery store. <laughs> Where in the grocery store in Japan, you have to put your own groceries in the bag, and you have to carry them out to the car, and nobody would offer you to help. So which is right? Neither's right. It's what the cultural norm is. And see, in, in, the, in the grocery store in Japan, they don't go and buy seven bags of groceries. They tend to <laughs> shop. They shop daily, is, is the typical routine. So they, they only have a couple of small bags. When Americans go to the store, man, we got two grocery carts full of stuff. And you know, if you were dependent upon packing your own bags, then the line would never get through. So I mean, just reasons and things. But, but to judge one society who values service in the service station, another one who values speed and low cost, pump my gas and get out, but wants service in the grocery store, I mean, th those kinds of differences you have to learn is different isn't wrong. You may choose to decide, I like certain things. And so the reality is, is the world is starting to become much more integrated in terms of what are the value systems that come out of multicultural experiences. And they tend to start to pick and choose and blend. And what kind of business practices exist? See, Japan, from a business st practice standpoint, still operates in some areas with business practices that exist nowhere else in the world. The rest of the world is all up on a very common set of business practices. And that's changing over time, because Japan will not be able to continue to be isolated from the rest of the world. And so the world is, is rapidly changing. And one of the key things as a human being that you all possess without even knowing it is your ability to adapt to change is much greater than 
two generations ago. My parents' generation, I mean, I'm sitting down with my mom, you know, saying, hey, let's, let's email each other, right? Oh, no, no, I like writing my letters. Well, then, you know, type your letters on, on an email and print it out. No, I like my typewriter. Now, we're not talking about an electric typewriter here. We're talking about a manual typewriter, okay? And she's 82 years old, and she's totally resistant to change. And, you know, that's okay. But change is fearful for her. She, she wants to do what she does. And, you know, our generation is, right, the transition generation. And, you know, we're trying to keep up with how you guys interact with the Internet and all the kinds of things that go on. You know, we're hanging in there okay. But the pace of change, every generation, just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. And one of the elements of change is the multicultural aspects of how we work together. Whether, wherever you're working is rapidly becoming you know, really an important part of, of being successful, the ability to respect other people, the ability to look at yourself, and the ability as a leader, how do you put all that together? And it's getting more difficult and more complicated, more challenging, but also, if you think about it from the right perspective, more exciting. Because if you're achievement-oriented, the greater the challenge, the greater the excitement when you are successful, then the more important the achievement is, okay? So I'm probably getting the hook sign without even uh, seeing it. Um, and I, I really appreciate your uh, participation, and uh, I wish you all uh, great success here at the GSM. This is, a, this is a great school, great faculty, great leadership, so I'll look forward to possibly running into a number of you at uh, some of the GSM events uh, over the coming years. So best of luck to all of you. I actually think that's a, a terrific note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for taking time. I know your schedule is very busy. I know you made special arrangements to be here today, and I do oh really gosh. appreciate it. Um, I think we've all learned something today about being more effective managers and leaders. Um, and having you talk today, I can't think of a better way to kick off the academic year, as well as the LAM Research Leadership, Leadership Skills Program this year. Um, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to offer this to you. Um, and again, thank you so much for taking the time today. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you.